Good afternoon. Uh, thanks so much for being here with us this afternoon. Welcome. I am Janice Kamina Resnick, and I welcome you on behalf of the members of our leadership team, which includes former Congressman Mel Levine and former LA County Supervisor Xavier Oslovsky. I want to congratulate Mel Levine on the birth of his first grandchild. Um, congratulations to you, Mel. We um, And we all hope that our friends in Florida are safely sheltered as Hurricane Milton makes landfall. Uh, we're keeping, um, we're, we're, we are actually keeping all of you in our thoughts and our hearts as this huge hurricane um, travels through your state. Uh, thank you and welcome to today's guest, Rick Hassan, and of course to our moderator, Warren Olney, tonight's topic about whether we can anticipate a smooth election and a peaceful transition of power is on everybody's mind. Thanks for being with us, Rick and Warren, to explore this important topic. Our next program is next Monday, October 14th at 5 p.m. We'll welcome Ron Brownstein, one of the country's foremost political journalists and analysts. He's a senior political anal analyst for CNN and a senior editor at The Atlantic and one of the sharpest and most knowledgeable political analysts around. The program election 2024, the final countdown, will be moderated by Larry Mantle with less than four weeks before election day. The program will focus on up to the minute current events related to the election. You can see that I voted and I'm hoping that all of you will vote early if you're offered that option in your state. There may be um, no political pundit that knows more about every single election in this country, however small the village is, to of course the broadest, the presidential election. So hope you'll join us. With Yom Kippur this weekend and the Harvest Festival of Sukkot next, next week uh, and for the eight days of holiday, we are doing our best to avoid the holidays and yet to be able to continue to bring you analysis in these critical weeks before election day. Um, we have a great lineup over the next uh, four weeks. We have Ron Brownstein next week. Uh, on Monday, October 21st, we have Harry Dunn, who was in the Capitol. He's a, he was a police, Capitol police officer, and he was in the Capitol fighting that uh, on that awful January 6th day. Um, in 2021. We then have Jennifer mm -hmm. Rubin. And on October 22nd, when we have Jen Jennifer Rubin, it is, believe it or not, the one year anniversary since David Lehrer's passing. And we're going to be a doing a tribute um, to David. His son will be joining us. And we hope that you'll all be sure to be here for that program. We have a lot of great programs. After Thanksgiving, we'll be going back to our once a week programming on Wednesdays at five o'clock. We know that made it much easier and more predictable for everybody. So we are uh, just waiting for that time when we can we can reschedule our programs for Wednesdays at five, knowing uh, that it's every week at that time. Um, we're wishing all who celebrate a great Yom Kippur, a meaningful holiday. Now I hand over the mic to uh, Warren Only, our wonderful moderator, whom this audience knows very well. Throughout Warren's career, he has, he has been known as one who fosters informed discussions on the full gamut of local, national, and international issues, never overlooking complexities or nuance. So we're very pleased to have him on our team. And now, Warren, the program is yours. Well, thank you, Janice, so much. And of course, as always, I'm very pleased to be here. As you indicated, the question of the night is, what are the chances of a peaceful transition of power? It's a scary question. It's scary that we even have to ask it. But of course, we do. Uh, we couldn't find a better person to ask about it than Rick Hassan. Uh, he is recognized internationally as an expert on election law. He's a professor at the UCLA Law School, where he started the Safeguarding Democracy Project. Uh, he's a founding co-editor of the Election Law Journal. That is a peer-reviewed publication. Uh, he runs the Election Law Blog, focusing on election security and campaign finance and related subjects. He's been an election law analyst for CNN, for NBC and MSNBC. And his recent book titles sort of evoke the headlines we've been hearing for the last few years. In 2020, he wrote Election Meltdown, Dirty Tricks, Distrust, and the Threat to American Democracy. In 2022, it was How Disinformation Poisons Our Politics and How to Cure It. And earlier this year, A Real, fight, a real Right to Vote, How a Constitutional Amendment Can Safeguard American Democracy. And Rick Hassan, it's great to have you with us. And thanks for joining us. It's great to be back with you, and I appreciate the invitation. So let me put the question to you, as much as we don't want to have to ask it, but uh, what do you, uh, given the background that I just outlined, believe are the chances 
of a peaceful transition of power uh, on the election day, November 5th, and on January 6th of next year, when the Congress is scheduled to oversee the uh, the uh, uh, confirmation of the vote. Right. I th and I think you really set the stage well when you said that uh, this is not something that I think either you or I thought we'd be talking about, at least in the United yeah. States. I could Im imagine us in a different world having a conversation about some fledgling democracy halfway around the world where they're trying to transition. And are they going to be able to do it? Like to even think that this would be a problem in the United States really shows how much deterioration we've had in our democracy. And, uh, you know, much of it traces back to what happened in 2020. I did write that book, Election Meltdown, in 2020, because I and others who study the field foresaw that uh, people's confidence in elections were, was deteriorating, that there were bad actors, both domestic and, and foreign, that were interested in trying to subvert election outcomes. And then really what we saw after the 2020 election by Donald Trump and his allies was an attempt to turn Donald Trump from an election loser into an election winner by manipulating not the like the ballots themselves, uh, it was not wasn't interfering with that, but manipulating the very arcane set of rules that we have that translate voters' votes into the formal formal time that Congress meets on the January sixth after the election and confirms who's won the electoral college votes in each state. It was kind of a multi-layered Byzantine kind of scheme of trying to get state. Um, uh, legislatures to come in and put in alternative slates of electors, trying to get the Secretary of State of Georgia, you may remember, to find 11,780 ballots, claim, get the Department of Justice to claim fraud. So I was very worried in, in 2020. I'm somewhat less worried in 2024. So if I was a, like a 9.9 .9 last time, maybe I'm a 7 now. Uh, I don't know if you take solace from a seven, but compared to a 9.9, .9, it's looking, <laughs> looking pretty good. And I, I can walk through what's changed and why I think that uh, things are maybe a little bit less dire than they looked last time. Well, do run through it. And I, what I'm interested in, you've used the word to distrust uh, in the uh, title of your uh, first book. You talked a moment ago about public confidence. And it seems to me uh, that that is a crucial element to uh, what we're talking about with uh, the Republican Party, uh, as all of those who support uh, President Trump, still refusing to concede that he was, in fact, the loser in 2020. How more important is that uh, to the question of uh, public confidence in the election coming up? Right. It's become kind of an article of faith. You may remember that moment in the vice presidential debate a couple of weeks back when Tim Walz pushed J.D. Vance yeah. like, did, did Donald Trump lose the election? And he wouldn't say. He said, I'm focused on the future. And we had Mike Johnson, the uh, Speaker of the House, Republican, also not willing to say. It's become a kind of article of faith. Uh, I don't know what people actually believe. Uh, either they are lying or they are gullible, uh, because uh, all reliable uh, evidence points to the fact that we had a free and fair election without a lot of fraud, without many irregularities in 2020 it was actually remarkably well done, given that we were in the middle of a pandemic and things had to be changed in order to accommodate fair and, and healthy voting. Um, and you're also right that uh, if you think about what makes a democracy work, I would point to something that political scientists call loser's consent. So what makes a democracy is not that the winners jump up and down and they're happy that their side is won. It's that the losers agree, you know, they grumble. I'm not happy yeah. my side lost, but it was a fair election. I'm going to reorganize. Maybe we'll do better next time. The loyal opposition kind of idea. If you lose the ability to um, uh, have the the um, those on the wrong side of the election accepted as legitimate, well, then all kinds of bad things can happen. If you don't believe the government is legitimate, you might not obey the government. You might take steps to try to overthrow the government, like all kinds of things. And so while I don't believe that many of the elites who profess that the you know Donald Trump actually won the last election actually believe it, I do believe that there are many millions of people in the country, thanks to Donald Trump and his allies, who do believe that. And that creates very volatile kinds of conditions where, you know, any grainy video of something that is pretty innocuous uh, involving the election can all of a sudden become some kind of conspiracy theory, much like we're seeing conspiracy theories right now about, um, you know, people controlling hurricanes and sending them into red areas. I mean, just really some crazy stuff that's out there. So what is it that makes you then uh, more sanguine 
that there's going to be a fair election and a, and a peaceful transition of power uh, than there was four years ago. Well, first of all, let's talk about how the election itself is going to be run. Back in 2020, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, there were lots of changes in the election rules. Uh, there were extensions of time for mailing in absentee ballots. Uh, many more people were voting by mail. Uh, there were you know, states that hadn't done it before. There were all of kinds of changes there because of COVID, right? And uh, we had some primaries that were postponed, you may remember, in Ohio and in other places because they couldn't get poll workers because it wasn't safe. This time around, we don't have that. I mean, there are challenges in running elections, but things are much smoother in terms of just the logistics of running elections. Uh, we don't have, you know, we don't have people like literally we had election officials scrambling to get PPE for their workers, you know, shields and things. So it was it was much harder. So uh, the election, you know, is uh, coming up in a few weeks. We already have in many places, including uh, in uh, California, people already voting early. Things seem to be going smoothly. So the election itself, as with as the last time, uh, I think you know we have every reason to believe it's it's going to go well. So then, what what could go wrong? What could go wrong could happen after the election, uh, and uh, in terms of people's confidence and in terms of trying to manipulate that, the, those outcomes. Uh, what about the uh, fact that uh, so many election officials have said they've been threatened, threatened with death, uh, threatened with all kinds of attacks that they might quit? If in fact uh, if things got any any worse than they were, or didn't get better, I should say, put it that way, um, has that not been an imp has had an impact? I think it has had an impact. There's been a lot of attrition. Uh, it's a thankless job. People who work in government generally are underpaid, and that includes people who work in elections. Um, but those who stayed have been resilient. They've been able to uh, you know maintain. Uh, uh, you know, enough staff. Uh, I'm not seeing a lot of complaints that, you know, people are short staffed for elections. Uh, of course, when people leave, you lose uh, some of that institutional memory, which is important. That does make me worried that, you know, somewhere something could go wrong that, that we might not, uh, uh, you know, think of. Uh, but really, the dangers, uh, you know, are going to come, I think, if there's an attempt to try to subvert the outcome of the election, to try to, again, turn the election loser into election winner. And, and here's three reasons why I'm less concerned than last time. First, in, at the end of 2022, Congress passed a law called the Electoral Count Reform Act. Uh, it was passed on December 22nd, almost the last day uh, the Democrats uh, controlled the House. Um, it was bipartisan in the Senate, less bipartisan, but a little bipartisan in the House. And what it did is it changed a number of those arcane rules I referred to earlier about the Electoral College, how you translate the Electoral College, uh, the voters' votes into the Electoral College. So, for example, one of Trump's arguments was uh, there was fraud, there were regularities. That means we had a failed election and there was this provision of this 1876 law that says, if a state has a failed election, the legislature can come in and appoint new electors. So that was so that language has been cleaned up. The idea, and this came out uh, in more detail last week in Jack Smith's filing in the Trump uh, uh, criminal case in, in Washington, D.C., the idea that Mike Pence, the vice president, who serves as the master of ceremonies in um, counting the Electoral College votes, that Mike Pence could simply throw out Electoral College votes he didn't like. The, this new law, the Electoral Count Reform Act, says vice president doesn't have that power. I think the fact that Kamala Harris is going to be the vice president motivated some of the Republicans to uh, want to pass this law. You know, the subversion can come from anywhere in theory. And so why not get the, these rules right? The, what it takes to object to an Electoral College vote, that's been fixed. OK, so that's number one. The second thing that happened is the Supreme Court decided a case uh, in 2023 called Moore versus Harper. And in that case, the court rejected this kind of extreme theory called the independent state legislature theory, the most extreme version of it, that state legislatures have kind of unbridled power over federal elections. They can do whatever they want. They can't be constrained by governors. They can't be constrained by state courts. They can't be constrained by state constitutions. That's the second thing that makes me a little more hopeful. The third thing is vigilance. You know, uh, I work with the Safeguard Democracy Project. There are many organizations around the country, Protect Democracy, uh, States United, Democracy. There are just a lot of people watching. And so when there are attempts to try to um, create pathways for subversion, and we can get into, for example, what's going on in Georgia right now with the certification process, there are lawsuits that are being filed. People are watching. Uh, you get people on the record and ask them, you know, what's it going to take? 
judges are very concerned. I've been speaking to a lot of judicial groups. They're very concerned. They, they, they really care about free and fair elections. They know they're going to be called upon to do the right thing. The courts did the right thing in 2020. And I think, uh, you know, that they're being supported to do the right thing in 2024 as well. Uh, Georgia, of course, is where they have ruled that uh, uh, election officials can be, or may have to count by hand uh, ballots, and I believe that's true in other places as well. Do you think that those cases challenging those kinds of uh, requirements are going to be thrown out? Well, so in Georgia, what happened is you've got, um, you know, as in every state, power is divided. So some powers in the hands of this election board that created the, yeah. the rules, some powers in the hands of the secretary of state, some in local election board. The secretary of state, remember, Brad Raffensperger, same guy that stood up to Trump when he tried to get him to change the election. He's still there. Uh, yeah. Brian Kemp, who refused to you know, send an alternative slate of electors, the governor of Georgia, he's still there. The attorney general, another Republican in Georgia, has said that what this election board did is likely illegal, coming up with these new rules that would essentially delay have the potential to delay the certification of the vote in Georgia. The idea is delay, delay, delay. Maybe this somehow could cause um, states not to uh, send in their electors to Congress. Nobody gets a majority of votes. And then you have this weird provision. Now we're really getting to the weeds under the 12th Amendment of the Constitution, where if nobody gets a majority of votes, you could have a so-called contingent election where each state House delegation, so the House of Representatives, the delegation from California, the delegation from Utah, they each would get one vote. That's a system that would benefit Trump because there are more Republican mm -hmm. uh, majority delegations than Democratic. It, it, for a lot of technical reasons, a lot of this is unlikely to happen. If you did, if Georgia didn't uh, submit its votes in time, there would be lawsuits. Uh, there's a provision in that Electoral Count Reform Act to go to federal court to force the state to do it. And the state itself, the Republicans who are in charge in Georgia are fighting this and saying this is probably illegal. So it, it's not as good everywhere else, but in Georgia, at least, the Republican leadership is standing up to these attempts to try to manipulate the process. Well, let me ask you about the rhetoric, though, particularly the rhetoric that, that uh, President Trump, former President Trump, uh, uses uh, when he and he, you know, according to the polls, has half the people in the country uh, supporting him. Uh, he says there's an invasion of criminal uh, immigrants that's uh, going to cheat and and uh, go on the ballot. Uh, he's talked about there being an enemy from within, and uh, uh, how 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 concerning. Are those kinds of statements to you? And to what extent do you think, particularly if there are questions about some of these elections, uh, that uh, people might, in fact, uh, get, get behind him and, and uh, try to disrupt the process of counting and, and certifying the ballot? Right. So this demonizing of immigrants, uh, I think, is very dangerous. I mean, we've seen the, you know, the, the um, uh, threats against uh, the uh, Haitian population living in Springfield, Ohio, after, you know, all of the uh, controversy there after Trump's comments and, and Vance's comments. It's very troubling. Is it going to interfere with the election? So one of the things we've been hearing, and we heard it as recently as today from Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson. Mike Johnson said uh, there are going to be thousands upon thousands of non-citizens voting in our elections. And, you know, they're kind of laying the groundwork for a claim of fraud. So you remember, Back in 2020, the claims of fraud in, involved things like absentee ballots that were coming in and concerns that, you know, ballots were going to be manipulated. Because it's not COVID, that, that, that doesn't seem to be able to fly. So there's been a lot of move of the rhetoric to demonize non-citizens, claim that they're going to vote. And that fits in with the anti-immigration rhetoric. As a legal strategy, I'm not convinced that talking about non-citizens uh, voting is going to be a very productive thing to do. And the reason I say that is uh, there's been a lot of investigation about non-citizen voting. Donald Trump claimed after the 2016 election, which, which he won, he lost the popular vote by about 3 million votes. He said there were 3 million non-citizens, 3 to 5 million non-citizens that voted in the election. He said all for Hillary Clinton. That was his claim. And there was an extensive investigation after 2016. How much non-citizen voting was there? There wasn't 3 million or 300,000 or 30,000, 3,000, 300. There were maybe 30 cases around the country that were possible. And so really what courts require when you try and overturn an election on the basis of fraud is you've got to come forward with evidence. 
And that evidence just won't be there because if you're a non-citizen and you go and vote, you're checked a box that you're a citizen and you vote, you're committing a felony that makes you not only deportable, but also subject to going to jail before you're deported. It's just not a reasonable crime for people to be thinking about committing. And you're going to one person's vote is not going to sway an election. So it just really doesn't happen on any scale. Your other point, I think, is is more well taken, which is if people believe that there's a lot of fraud, will there be violence? And so when I think about the risks that are remain, you know, why I'm still at a seven point something, uh, one of those risks is violence or interference at polling places, at places where ballots are being counted. Uh, you may have seen the, uh, the the television show Succession, the spoiler alert. Don't mm -hmm. listen to my next sentence if you haven't seen the end of it. <laughs> Uh, but there was a, uh, you know, a, it was a, a, a uh, an election um, scenario in Wisconsin where ballots were being stored that had not yet been counted. And, and there was an arson fire and set the ballots on fire. I mean, all kinds of violence or interruption is possible. In my 2020 book, Election Meltdown, I wrote about, a you know, what if there's a cyber attack that takes down the power in a city like Detroit? And, you know, what happens on Election Day? So th that kind of bad stuff can still happen. Uh, there can be interference. Um, there's been discussions with police departments, with sheriff's departments about how to secure the vote. But that is really a risk. And part of that risk comes from activating a population by making them convinced that their their democracy is being stolen from them. You know, if you look at polling, uh, more people think that Democrats are trying to steal elections than Republicans. And part of that is from the rhetoric that is relentlessly coming from Donald Trump. Well, let me ask about North Carolina, where uh, Hurricane Helene has uh, d practically destroyed uh, numbers of uh, whole towns. Uh, and now we have, as was mentioned earlier uh, by Janice, we have a Hurricane Milton moving over Florida. Uh, to what extent are those concerning you in terms of the ability of, of, of people there to, A, get the vote in at all, and B, uh, count it up in such a way that anybody can count on the results? Well, so uh, the second point, I think, is less worrisome. That is, uh, we have ways of <laughs> collecting ballots and making sure that that they are right. Now, in terms of people being disenfranchised, this is a real problem. Um, uh, in the state of uh, Florida, they're very well um, uh, prepared in terms of hurricanes and elections. Uh, Florida is one of the few states that has passed a bunch of laws because this is a perennial problem. This yeah. is the that the, the hurricane season continues through election day. And so they have procedures in place. Uh, you know, they know what to do. Not every state um, has clear procedures on what to do. And so just, I think, I can't remember if it was yesterday or today, the North Carolina Election Board um, voted unanimously, Democrats and Republicans, the five members of the board, voted to extend certain deadlines to make sure that people who are in affected areas are going to be able to request their absentee ballot, going to be able to vote. Um, there are going to be people that are going to be disenfranchised. And um, the, the I think the effort has to be made uh, as much as possible for those pe to get those people the opportunity to vote. But let me tell you, if you've lost your house uh, or you've lost, uh, you know, uh, pe people have lost uh, family members, you know, they're th these are very serious things. Uh, voting might be the last thing on their minds. I mean, so uh, natural disasters do happen. And uh, I think it could potentially affect the vote. I don't know if there's going to be any partisan impact in terms of, you know, more Democrats or more Republicans voting in a particular way. But this is a real problem. It's one of the reasons why um, people, it's good for people to have different options to be able to vote, uh, being able to vote early, being able to mail in a ballot. Uh, some people, there's been a huge evacuation in Florida. Uh, Florida is a state that's heavily vote by mail. I hope that those people who've left their homes have taken their ballots with them and they'll be able to mail them in. So uh, people who are prepared, we'll, we're going to see some effect. But, uh, you know, I, I I don't think that that itself is going to make the election illegitimate, that it's going to make the election you know, somehow problematic. The good thing is it's not happening on election day where it would have a much greater impact since many people vote in person. Well, back, though, to the question of public trust. Uh, we have uh, President Trump, former President Trump, uh, saying that, in fact, uh, the damage is all in areas where there are people that are going to vote for him. Marjorie Taylor Greene has even suggested that there's something intentional about that. I don't think we have to respond to that as if it were uh, a serious issue. But 
by the same token, we have this issue, this this question of eroding the public uh, trust and confidence uh, in, in the election with the uh, uh, the weather situation, uh, climate change, whatever you want to call call the uh, concept, the the cause of it uh, being so important. Yeah, I know, absolutely true, and I think that um, really Trump has seized on whatever he can to try to delegitimize the process. I mean, he's he has explicitly said either he wins or there was cheating. You know, and if that's your position going into an election, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's anything he won't say that no. would support, uh, you know, the, his view that uh, he'll seize on anything. Um, now, who's he convincing? Uh, I don't know that um, like like there is a Trump has a floor that he cannot go below, but he also has a ceiling that is. Uh, you know, there, there there are people who will believe whatever he says. And then there are lots of people, some people who will, uh, are Republicans, they'll hold their nose and vote for Trump, but they're not taken in by this. And the question is, is this really changing anyone's minds, you yeah. know, when these outlandish claims of fraud are being made? And I don't think so. In my experience, um, when you talk to some people who believe that the last election was stolen, there's no amount of evidence. It's really, you know, the problem is not a lack of supply of truthful information. The problem is a demand problem. That is, people want to hear the false information because it serves their worldview and helps them to explain why, if they didn't, if their side didn't win the election, it must have been because there was some kind of fraud. Uh, last year at the uh, uh, UCLA Safe Safeguarding Democracy Project, uh, you and a panel came up with 24 for 24, 24 ideas that uh, might be Im implemented in the uh, election or in advance of the election of, of, of this coming year. And you suggested that uh, recommendations that were aimed at government officials, at journalists, at social media companies, and at the general public. Uh, what are some of those issues? And uh, have they, in fact, been uh, implemented in such a way that they make you more confident about the election than you might have been? Or is it the other way around? Have they not been implemented? Well, some have been implemented and some haven't. Let me talk about one that's partially been implemented, but that gives me a lot of heartburn because it hasn't been implemented everywhere. So mail-in ballots come in to election offices over the weeks before election day. In most states, including California, including Florida, uh, uh, including Colorado, lots of states, the ballots are pre-canvassed. That is, they do everything but count the ballot. They make sure that the envelope is sealed. They make sure that the signature is correct. They make sure that all the information is properly filled out. And what that does is it um, means that you can have a faster count on election day. And one of the recommendations we made in our 24 for 24 report was that every state should do this because the period between the time that the voting uh, is over and the time that there's an unofficial declaration of who the winner is by news organizations, that's a very dangerous time. You may remember that uh, Donald Trump on the night at, uh, 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 at the end of the election at two o'clock in the morning, he declared victory, mm -hmm. even though the, the race was too uh, close to call. Um, and according to Jack Smith's indictment, that was his plan all along, that he was gonna declare victory no matter uh, what happened. Now, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, two perennial swing states, have not changed their rules because they have Republican legislatures that have not been willing to go along and change those rules. On election night in 2020, Donald Trump had a, a, a tally of 160,000 more votes than Joe Biden. It was not until the Saturday after election day, so you know, five days later, when enough votes had been counted in uh, Pennsylvania, and Joe Biden had about an 80,000 vote lead that news organizations were willing to call Pennsylvania for Biden. That period of time is very dangerous because, you know, people worry about, you know, why is it that, that you hear about ballot dumps? Why is it that the vote totals are changing? And, you know, we understand, we in the business understand what's happening, which is mail-in ballots take longer to count, more Democrats vote by mail than Republicans because Donald Trump demonizes vote by mail. And so you get this so-called blue shift or sometimes referred to as the red mirage. Start out with this one um, uh, person who has more ballots. In the end, that person doesn't win. So uh, we recommended that every state make that switch. Two states that are crucial did not do that. 
Uh, we also recommended, relatedly, that news organizations, and I remember talking to people at CNN about this when I was a CNN analyst in 2020, news organizations not say on, say, election night, Trump is in the lead or Biden is in the lead, that that language suggests to voters that there's like, you know, it's like a sports contest where one side has uh, has has scored more points than the other side. All the ballots are in. They just haven't all been counted. So the framing of too early to call is more appropriate so that people realize the votes are done, but the counting takes time. And uh, that message really got through. We uh, uh, from the Safeguarding Democracy Project, we spoke to people at the AP and we spoke to people at ABC News. Like We were really pushing this message. And that one, I think, was successful. And it's very unusual to hear someone talk about one candidate being in the lead anymore when we know that these ballot totals are going to change. What did, would you recommend or did you recommend that social media uh, companies do? Because they might not be uh, amenable to the ideas that you just suggested of uh, of uh, not, not counting the vote and, and saying who's in, uh, in the lead at this particular moment. Well, of course, there's been a huge change with social media companies uh, yeah. from 2020 to, to 2024. Uh, one thing that's different is that um, uh, Twitter, uh, which is now called X, used to have a trust, trust and safety team. Uh, they were dealing with uh, labeling or demoting or removing certain election disinformation. That trust and safety team has been decimated. Uh, they've been all been fired. We recently did an event at the Hammer Museum with Yoel Roth, who used to head their trust and safety team and was let go by Musk. Um, uh, you can watch a recording of that on the Safeguard and Democracy Project website and uh, and see what he had to say about that. Uh, what has Elon Musk replaced that with? Well, he has become the largest spreader of election disinformation in the world. He has, I, I, some, I, someone said, I'm not sure if this figure is right, 200 million worldwide followers. He, he basically automatically added to everyone's Twitter feed. And he is constantly spreading false and misleading and incendiary claims about um, Democrats stealing elections. I mean, he really, he called himself what, dark MAGA? Uh, this is aside from him spending tens of millions of dollars on a super PAC that is supporting Donald Trump's campaign. You know, we were uh, hearing, uh, you know, look at the bias of social media companies. They didn't um, share information about Hunter Biden's laptop in 2020. And I think that's actually a very valid criticism. But now you have the head of a social media company who's admittedly in the tank for one of the candidates who is constantly spreading false information about the candidates. So the, you know, the social media atmosphere, I and mean, it's like he is, uh, Elon Musk is pouring gasoline on top of all of this. Facebook, it's a different situation. Mark Zuckerberg still controls Facebook, but, but Mark Zuckerberg has been burned by criticism that he was uh, helping Democrats too much. You may remember Donald Trump was removed from the platform after mm -hmm. the January 6th insurrection. You may remember that um, Zuckerberg stepped up when there wasn't adequate funding for local election officials. And he and his wife's foundation gave $300 million to support the um, local election officials so they could run a fair and safe election. Then he was demonized for it. The Hunter Biden laptop story, he was hauled before Congress. And he's basically what's happened with Facebook is they're demoting political content. Uh, if you're on Threads, which is a kind of offshoot of uh, Instagram, also owned by um, uh, you know the same company, Meta, uh, controlled by Mark Zuckerberg, demoting political content. So Zuckerberg is trying to just put his head down and get through the election, knowing that there's probably an even chance that Republicans are going to control the government uh, come uh, January. And so, you know, he's he, he's out of it. They've also reduced their trust and safety teams. So we had some recommendations for social media companies. Some of it relates to policing election misinformation about when, where, how people vote that that content needs to be policed. These are private companies. The Supreme Court affirmed in a case that they decided last spring that social media companies, when they moderate content, they're like newspapers. They can decide what content to include and exclude. And we argue they should be responsible corporate citizens and not be vectors for sharing uh, misinformation. Uh, further, uh, you know, we said it should be easier for um, uh, people who want to find accurate election information to be able to figure out, can I find the official um, um, feed of my local election uh, administrator, my local county clerk or whatever the official is called there? Um, give those people .gov email addresses, give them .gov um, uh, websites, give them 
verified status on these social media sites. Some of that has happened. That is very valuable. So vo voters who are trying to get true information can find it. Not enough of it has happened in part because of the change in control at uh, what used to be Twitter. I want to give the uh, viewers an opportunity to uh, ask some questions and I'll uh, pose them using the uh, chat. Uh, so I would hope people would contribute to it, which they have been doing. Uh, but quickly before that, uh, you also had some recommendations in this 24 for 24 uh, for, for the general public. What did you mean? What, 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 what did you have in mind for that? Well, I mean, one of the things that Yoel Roth, uh, the former head of um, trust and safety at Twitter, said, uh, and it echoes something that's in our report, is people should be careful before they share content. Uh, uh, political content uh, that uh, you know makes factual claims about how the election is run. Uh, when people see things that conform with their beliefs, uh, they're likely to share it, and then things go viral. And this happens on the left and the right. Um, uh, in my um, uh, 2022 book, Cheap Speech, I talk about this: uh, somebody seeing a picture of a bunch of uh, postal trucks. One, uh, not postal trucks. Uh, um, post boxes, one stacked up after the other. And somebody posted this picture. They had been walking in some area in Wisconsin, saw this picture. Someone else saw it and said, here it is. Here's the voter suppression. They're hiding the mailboxes so that people won't be able to get their ballots in. Well, it turns out the place was the place where they send mailboxes to be repainted after they get rusty and old. And, you know, you had thousands of people, including celebrities, sharing this information. So think before you share. Uh, you know, be a responsible citizen uh, when, you know, because, right, it used to be that the only ones who really had access to a megaphone was, you know, whoever owned the radio station, whoever owned the local newspaper, the local TV station. Now we've all got a little megaphone and you never know what's going to go viral in part because some of this is being driven by algorithms. They're driven not, not by people, but by computers yeah. that are figuring out what other people want to see. And so, you know, Things happen in an unexpected way. And so people have a responsibility to be um, uh, good citizens themselves. Not only vote, but don't be the ones who are contributing to the problem. There's also, you know, because our elections are so decentralized, there's always room to be an election observer, see what's going on on the local level, uh, to volunteer as a poll worker, to volunteer as a um, someone who is assisting people at the polls. There are lots of opportunities for people to be involved in the process. And when people get involved in the process, they uh, uh, tend to trust it more because they see what all the checks and balances are. Uh, Margaret wants to know, are you concerned about the uh, effort of the Russians to interfere with the election? Well, so what we've seen so far, and this is mostly uh, information that's coming from the US government, is that um, uh, Russian government, uh, Chinese government, and Iranian government uh, operatives are trying to influence our elections, not all necessarily in the same direction or in the same way. Um, we've become, I think, used to this. I think to the extent that this is about spreading uh, false information, uh, something has changed between 2020 and 2024, which I think people have become a little more uh, skeptical about all information they see. In some ways, that's a little bit inoculating. You know, like people are less likely to be taken in by things uh, than uh, uh, than they were in the past. So I'm not sure that these kind of influence operations are likely to uh, have the intended effect. Um, and people are looking for it. Uh, you know, right. Uh, uh, you know, right now you have a government. Uh, the U.S. government is on the lookout for this. And they are sharing information uh, as it comes out about what these attempts are. So I am concerned about it. I don't know if there's much to do about it. I'm more concerned about, you may remember the Russians in 2016, uh, how did they do damage? It wasn't really uh, from, I mean, it was pretty minor from pretending to be voters and trying to discourage people from voting for Hillary Clinton. It was that they hacked emails from the DNC and they mm. shared them. Truthful information, not fake information. Um, we could see something like that. You know, we always talk about the October surprise. Uh, it's October 9th. Uh, it's about time for a surprise. Uh, you know, we'll see you know, what, might, what might be released. And of course, there's always the danger, as I mentioned earlier, of cyber attacks. I mean, I think that is like really, that's like a 
uh, an act of war against the United States. Mm. But I, you know, because there are non-state actors that could also engage in this kind of conduct, or there could be state actors who could be, um, uh, you know, somehow insulated from governments. I, I, I worry more about that than anything else, like some kind of interference with our, our either our voter registration processes or infrastructure, uh, infrastructure like our, you know, electrical grid. You know, we see all these uh, ransomware attacks. We see all of these things happening that can, you know, shut down different kinds of computer networks. We're so dependent on technology. That to me is is more worrisome than say, you know, people going on social media and, and creating fake personas and trying to convince people of how they should vote. Uh, here's a question from Pamela. She says, if you saw the documentary War Games, the veterans were concerned that a political coup would be backed by rogue members of the U.S. military. Are you concerned about extremists in the ranks of the U.S. military and the National Guard? And I'd add to this that uh, Donald Trump has said that he might well mobilize the military in terms of uh, uh, in, in the effort to round up uh, uh, people that he regards as uh, illegal aliens so he can uh, put them in camps and perhaps deport them. Yes, we had a screening uh, at the Hammer Museum of this documentary war game, and we had yeah. um, Steve Bullock, who was the former um, governor of Montana. He role played the president in this uh, in this movie, and they were trying to deal with this issue. I'm not an expert on civil military relations. It was very chilling to me as like kind of a consumer of that. I can mm -hmm. only speak to how law can constrain things. Um, you know, uh, the fact that you now have, you don't have Trump in charge of the military right now. Uh, and you have, I think, the upper echelons of the US military are very concerned about extremism in the ranks. And I know they've been working on that problem, but it's really a little bit outside my area. But it does make me realize, I, I didn't say the thing I'm most worried about, about the election. I, you know, I went through the idea of violence. The thing that worries me most right now is what if there's lawlessness in the US House of Representatives? Um, because, you know, what's going to happen is there's going to be votes uh, that are going to take place. There's going to be electoral college certifications. They're going to be mailed in to um, Congress. The, and then this January 6, 2025, there's going to be a, a meeting of the joint house, uh, houses of Congress where they're going to open the envelopes and they're going to count the ballots. Right. And, and there are rules and the rules for how that works. Uh, some of those rules are contained in that 2022 law. I mentioned the Electoral Count Reform Act. Well, Mike Johnson, who is the Speaker of the House right now and may or may not be the Speaker of the House uh, come January 3rd when Congress, the new Congress comes in, there's going to have to be a vote for the Speaker of the House. That could be its own thing, because you may remember we started with Kevin McCarthy and we didn't end with Kevin McCarthy this time yeah. around. Uh, Mike Johnson has been kind of equivocal about you know, are you going to just accept the certification from the states if the states say it's okay? And he says, well, we'll have to see if it's a free and fair election. And he yeah. said, and I said, as I mentioned earlier, there are thousands and thousands of non-citizens voting. So I do worry that, you know, despite the rules that are in place and despite the um, uh, safeguards that uh, that have been added since, since 2020, law is only as constraining as people's willingness to obey the law. And like, if people are not gonna obey the law, now we're now we're outside my area of expertise. Now we're talking about, you know, what does it take, you know, to have, a, a, you know, authoritarianism and to move into something else. That gives me great concern. And not hearing reassurances from Mike Johnson, the way you would hear, it's not all Republicans, like you do hear those reassurances from someone like Mitch McConnell, yeah. Um, you know, there are many responsible Republicans who did the right thing, but there are also many Republicans who, for example, objected to the, the count of the um, uh, vote, the Electoral College votes from Arizona and Pennsylvania, even mm -hmm. after the violence on January 6th, 2021. And I don't know what camp Mike Johnson falls in, but, you know, he was one of the people that was supporting a brief that was filed by the state of Texas directly in the Supreme Court that was trying to throw out the Electoral College votes of a number of states that Biden had won where there were Republican um, majorities in those state legislatures that maybe could have substituted a different slate of electors. So that, to me, is one of the weakest links. And and that really, like your that, like the, the question that the person submitted about the war game, you know, uh, and the military, people 
who just simply will disobey the law, now we're in some real trouble. Uh, Victor wants to know, he has a question about the structure of the system. Would it be better if we had universal federal laws and regulations for the way federal elections are uh, covered uh, rather than going state by state? I do think that uh, there is um, there's good reason uh, for the United States to be like almost every other democracy around the world in having a national nonpartisan system to run elections. I actually first proposed that in a 2012 book called The Voting Wars. I've given up on that. I, I no longer uh, push it, not because I don't think it's the right thing to do. I do think it's the right thing to do. But I no longer push it because the decentralized partisan nature of our elections is fiercely defended by people at the local level. In fact, some people argue that much better that we didn't have an election czar, an election board that Trump could have tried to manipulate in 2020. We have a decentralized system. And so the question is, how can we strengthen it in yeah. each state? I, 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 you know, if we lived in a different world, uh, you can imagine like in Canada or in Australia, these are two countries, I think, very comparable to the United States in terms of advanced democracies. They have nonpartisan election administration. They know that if you walk in in one part of the country or the other, the ballot's going to look the same. The rules are going to be the same. They don't have this hodgepodge of rules and some partisans running elections. Um, it would be better, but I don't think it's in our future, at least not in the future I expect I'm going to see. Uh, Gerald has a question about the significance of the 12th Amendment and how it'll play in the confirmation. Will you please clarify the amendment as it is confusing to non-legal readers what happens if the Republicans refuse to confirm the result? Will we be left in limbo? There's a lot in the 12th Amendment, and I have to confess it's not something I've spent a lot of time on uh, because you know th there are contingencies in there that I hope are unrealistic. So one possibility is that there is like the Congress can't get its act together uh, by January 20th. Remember, they meet on January 6th. The new president takes over January 20th. What if Congress hasn't done its job yet? What if we don't even have a organization of the House of Representatives yet because there's been no uh, Senate? Well, then uh, under the rules, I think we would have President Chuck Grassley, uh, President pro tem of the Senate, yeah. um, uh, a, 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 um, a very senior member of the Senate. Um, very senior. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and there are some arguments it could be someone else, and like how these rules are going to work is somewhat uncertain as well. Um, but so that's, you know, part of the 12th Amendment is dealing with, you know, if if there can't be a choice. Uh, you know, there's also an issue. Um, what happens if a state doesn't submit its um, uh, slate of electors because they're disagreeing and they're, the, the state doesn't submit it all? I think, again, as I said earlier, it's very unlikely to happen. But what if it happens? Under this new Electoral Count Reform Act, that, that state's, the number of electors from that state is removed from the denominator. So you would no longer need 270 votes, you know, the, the more than half of the 538 votes, in order to be able to win. Uh, you would go to uh, a lower denominator. But it would affect how many votes you need to actually win. It could affect the outcome of the election. We could potentially have a 269-269 tie in the Electoral College. And then if that happens, if someone does not get a majority, we go to those rules that I mentioned earlier uh, in the program, which is essentially the contingent election where each House delegation gets one vote. I hope we never have to experiment with these things. Uh, I think the last time we had something like that was 1824. And uh, let's hope that we don't see it again. Uh, that question was being was asked by a, a person who also wanted to know, uh, in addition to whether it might be thrown into the uh, Republican-controlled Congress, uh, what about the U.S. Supreme Court? Is the U.S. Supreme Court likely to get involved uh, in any of the issues that uh, you see uh, possibly coming up? Yeah, I actually have a piece that will post in the morning at Slate on uh, the question of Supreme Court involvement. I think it's less likely that the court's going to get involved this time than last time, uh, last time being 2020, because... There are fewer significant legal issues that are likely to arise. Uh, two caveats to that. Number one, if we have a close enough election, like a Bush versus Gore type 2000 election, where it comes down to one state and a few hundred or a few thousand ballots in one state, then all bets are off. Then, then the margin of error in how the election was run is going to exceed the margin of victory and the Supreme Court is going to get involved and it's going to be probably pretty partisan uh, because that we know that from, from last time. 
Uh, but but for that to happen, like everything has to go wrong. Like, you know, it has to be just one state and that state has to be really, really close. Uh, but the other thing I'm concerned about and where the courts might get involved is if at some point along the process, there is a failure to certify, whether that's at the state level, whether that is at the level of Congress, uh, you know, if um, if there is some attempt to uh, stop a state from submitting its electors or some kind of dispute, no doubt people are going to try and get the Supreme Court involved. Whether they will get involved or not, not clear to me. It may depend on what the legal issue is. Last time around in 2020, the court did not get involved, did not take up that petition from Texas to try to inject itself into the process. I would hope that the Supreme Court would continue to do the right thing, would protect the will of the voters to make sure that the winner of the election actually reflects the choice of the people. I mean, that's a really low bar, right? That we actually have the winner of the election take office. But that if there's one thing that the courts should do, it is that step. Uh, Claude wants to know if uh, uh, Kamala Harris wins the election uh, and has to provide over January 6th as a vice president to do that job of confirmation, um, would she be required to step down given the fact that it's her election that she would be confirming? In fact, no. And we have had situations where sitting vice presidents have presided over uh, their own uh, county. In fact, Al Gore, who lost, uh, thanks to the Supreme Court in Bush versus Gore, presided over the um, uh, the confirmation of Bush as the winner of the Electoral College votes. And he rejected attempts to uh, object to the counting of those votes. Um, we have a lot of strange arcane rules in our constitution <clears throat> that we certainly would not put in our constitution today if we were writing a new one. The problem is it's so hard to amend our constitution that we're stuck with a lot of these rules. And so we do second best, like in that Electoral Count Reform Act, there's clarification. All the vice president is, is the master of ceremonies. She stands there and opens the envelopes and does not have any substantive role in the process. Marilyn wants to know, is Common Causes program to sponsor a volunteer election protector a good one? Or if so, if not, uh, what other programs are good uh, for us to help finance? Uh, um, yeah, uh, so I'm not, I'm not familiar specifically with the Common Cause program. Yeah. There is a, an election protection consortium. Uh, if you Google election protection, that should be the first thing that comes up. And they have volunteers. They ban uh, uh, phone banks uh, around the country. Uh, there are there are many opportunities to volunteer uh, to try to to try to help, uh, as well as uh, as I mentioned, uh, lots of places are still looking for poll workers because you know it's a it's a long day or multiple days and it's it could be a a um, uh, you know but with these threats you know some people could be a little reticent so if you want to get involved there are ways to get involved to try to help support our democracy. Uh, Alan says, uh, he may have already addressed this, is the election challenged all the way to the Supreme Court? Will they not rule in favor of Trump, as happened uh, with the hanging chads in Florida when the court ruled for uh, Bush over uh, uh, Gore? What are the chances of something like that happening again? So, um, you know, I don't think we should assume that because there is a majority of Republican appointed justices that they would necessarily rule for Trump if there were a close election. Um but what we do know is that um, there's a lot of motivated reasoning. Uh, when, when the election is like razor thin close and you've got to look at these issues like the hanging chat issue, obviously it wouldn't be that issue, but something like that. Motivated reasoning matters a lot. So the, the, the thing I like to point to is after Bush versus Gore was over, after Bush was in office, someone took all the ballots from Florida, which were public records under Florida's law, and they sent them to a, a, a place in Chicago that uh, that uh, uh, basically does research. And they asked people that, that to, to code the ballots. Was this a vote for Bush? Was it a vote for Gore? And, you know, one of the things they found was that under the rules that that Gore proposed, Bush would have won. Under the rules that Bush proposed, Gore would have won. <laughs> but they also found that that the workers, like nothing's on the line now because Bush is already president. The workers who identified as Democrats were more likely to find votes for Gore uh, than mm. the workers who uh, identified as Republicans. And I don't think that this is anything conscious, but you know, when you have a, a, a feeling about something, uh, it can affect how you reason through it. And I don't think our Supreme Court justices are immune 
from that phenomenon. We talked about Elon Musk a little earlier. Uh, what about his offering $47 for people identifying Trump voters? Does this cross the line into buying votes? And is it illegal? I don't believe it's illegal um, because uh, what he's paying for are leads. Essentially, his super PAC is trying to find people who are likely to uh, vote for Trump. So they want people who are willing to sign a petition supporting the First and Second Amendment, uh, Second Amendment right to bear arms. And so like this is like, how do we identify Trump voters? Um, they are, um, people are not being paid to vote. And so the prohibition is on paying someone to vote or not to vote or for um, to vote in a particular way. Uh, just uh, uh, today, uh, there's a... Um, there's a company called Cards Against Humanity. They make these uh, these uh, humorous cards. They uh, they're on the left, where Musk is on the right, and they are uh, offering uh, a certain payment now for um, someone who didn't vote in 2020, and they can verify that through voter records. If you didn't vote in 2020 and you make a voting plan, then you can get paid for making a voting plan. And like that's coming closer to the line. I was just interviewed about this uh, by the New York Times. And I think I think it doesn't cross the line, but it's, that one is closer to the line. Uh, but I understand that there are other experts who think differently. Uh, everyone is looking for an advantage now and, you know, what that's going to be. You may remember the um, the fight over pizza and water on the lines in Georgia. I think there's even the subject of a Larry David Curb Your Enthusiasm episode. Yeah. Um, the whole idea of prohibiting people from get, being, giving them a glass of water is like, well, that's a bribe. You know, you can't do that to voters with a certain amount of, uh, of space. In lots of states, giving people food and water while they're waiting, so long as it's not to voters only, is not a problem. You can't have incentives only for voters. But uh, because this election is so hotly contested and uh, people are looking for every advantage, they're just looking for whatever they can do to get out the, those voters who are not usual voters, you know, lot, almost every poll we're seeing is within the margin of error. And this is one of the closest elections in, uh, mo according to the polling, in modern times. And so uh, when it's that close, uh, you know, people have very strong feelings. They're looking for ways to try to push things one way or the other. We talked earlier about the kinds of changes that are being made in election law in places like Georgia with the uh, uh, what the uh, uh, voting people are being asked to do there. Uh, Lisa Heck wants to know, is there still a chance that uh, there are last minute changes that are being made uh, having to do with hand counting and election boards and so on and so forth? Or has the time passed for those to uh, to get underway? And, and another uh, uh, viewer wanted to know uh, if you could elaborate a bit on the lawyers and others that uh, you talked about vigilance that uh, the uh, the Democrats have uh, uh, trying to monitor uh, these kinds of things so that uh, they can uh, head them off in advance. Well, there's no shortage of lawyers and there's no shortage of money funding lawyers and people are are, are very uh, uh, well. Uh, <laughs> this is a very well lawyered election. Uh, highly competent lawyers aggressively litigating on both sides. Sure. Uh, on the question of whether it's too late, uh, there's no statute that says you can't change the rules at the last minute. But when you try to change the rules at the last minute, uh, you're going to get pushback from the courts. I mean, this is one of the arguments against some of the Georgia changes. There was just a lawsuit filed in um, Pennsylvania over whether ballots that are lacking dates but that are timely should be counted. And the state Supreme Court said, it's too late. You should have come to us way back. We're not going to decide this now. It's really tough to uh, it's tough on election administrators, it's tough on voters to make changes at the last minute. And then the question is, why is this change being made and is it really necessary? But there's no hard and fast rule that says there's an X date and then you can't make changes anymore. But of course, we already have a few million people that have already voted in this country. Voting is happening right now and will happen all throughout the month of October and the beginning of November. Uh, Mort says, uh, why aren't uh, Trump's criminal convictions and pending legal exposure repeatedly listed in Rep Democratic National Committee campaign the commercials, I don't know if the uh, substance of the commercials is, is something that you want to uh, try to dictate. That, that's well beyond me. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure they do polling and figure out what they think sells. And, and uh, you know, I, I think what I'm hearing is people want to talk about uh, issues like um, the economy, 
and abortion and immigration, things that are on people's minds. Uh, we've come to the end of the program, and we always ask people at the end, uh, can you say anything that would make people feel somewhat more optimistic or somewhat better? You really did that from the beginning, it seems to me, and you have in, along the way uh, talked about things, that uh, reasons that b people might feel uh, less concerned than they did when they be we began the conversation. But let me just give you an, op uh, an opportunity once again uh, to answer the, the, the broad question about whether we're going to have a, a peaceful transition of power. Uh, and what do you think the chances are that things will go well? So, you know, I wouldn't use the word optimistic about how I feel. I would say no. hopeful and I would say guarded and I would say vigilant. And so the, mo the biggest protection for safeguarding our democracy is people paying attention and people watching the rules and making sure that the rules are being followed. Rule of law is what really matters here. Uh, let's set, figure out what the rules are and let's make sure everybody follows them. And if we can do that, we can have a fair election. And so uh, I'm going to take some comfort in the fact that people are reaching out to me all the time. They're concerned about our democracy. They want to make sure it's going to flourish. And that that concern, the fact that people are not just withdrawing, that is very important in terms of public confidence and in terms of public support for free and fair elections. Very quickly, uh, uh, there was a question about this, which I didn't ask earlier, and that is, how can people uh, be helpful? Uh, are there are there things that you can recommend that people can do? Right. So I would point back to the election protection work, poll worker, and, uh, you know, um, be a, an informed citizen. Uh, don't don't spread misinformation and, uh, you know, keep paying attention and put the pressure on if necessary to make sure that people in power who have to certify our election will do the right thing. Rick Hassan, uh, what a pleasure it is to talk with you. I'm sure the audience will agree that you have been extraordinary. You're an encyclopedia when it comes to election law. And uh, there's a good reason that you are recognized uh, around the world uh, for your expertise in this area. Thank you so very much for being with us. It was a really a pleasure, Warren. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next uh, Monday, Ron Brownstein is going to be there with uh, uh, Larry Mantle. Uh, and they'll be talking about the final countdown. will be quite the final countdown, a bit of a misnomer there. Uh, there are others before the election itself. But you'll hear a lot from uh, Ron Brownstein. He's a great, great guest. Thank you all for watching. Have a good night.